And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Deep Brain Stimulation, Your Questions Answered. I'm Dr. Sonia Mather. As was mentioned, I'm a family physician, Parkinson's patient for the last 21 years, and a proud member of the director, Board of Directors for the Davis Sydney Foundation. And I have the pleasure of being your moderator as well today. So today's webinar is in follow-up, um, as Mel might have mentioned, to one of our previous webinars, where we weren't able to answer all your questions. And there's such interest in this relevant subject that we thought we would ask another expert to come on and, and help us out by sharing some of their wisdom with us. Joining us today is Dr. Helen Bronte-Stewart. She's a professor in the departments of neurology, neurological science, and neurosurgery at Stanford School of Medicine. She's authored an impressive number of publications in the field of Parkinson's, and her research interests include how the brain controls movement, balance, and gait disorders. And she's taken her expertise and love for dance to incorporate a dance studio into the Stanford Neurosciences Health Center. I hope we have a little bit of time to talk about that. Welcome, Dr. Bronte Stewart. Thank you so much, Sonia. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And what we're going to do today is we're going to do this really interesting uh, question and answer session, just starting with a few slides to kind of highlight some of the points. So I'm just going to put those up right now. Sure. So I hope those are visible to everybody. Um, <clears throat> so as Sonia said, I, uh, I work at Stanford University and, and we're very interested and in, do a lot of deep brain stimulation. And so this is somewhat uh, Q and A about sort of who, when, why, and, and how do we, what do we do after the surgery? So here we go. So as you know, uh, deep brain stimulation for movement disorders, we can really regard this as the first generation of a brain pacemaker. And uh, we have chronic stimulating electrodes implanted deep into the basal ganglia or the deep structures of the brain. And we use the frame-based or frameless stereotaxy to accurately target these deep brain structures. And then we also use intraoperative electrophysiology where we can actually define the sensory motor regions and very accurately place these leads. And these um, pacemakers currently are on all the time and they can't sense the brain activity they are modulating, um, but they have been very successful. And I'll just move to the next slide and then Sonia and I can discuss some of this, but it's really just to show you that the brain itself is the reason why we can do this deep brain stimulation. Because if you can see on this slide, it's a schematic that just shows um, the, the areas of the cortex and these deep structures called the basal ganglia. And don't worry about all the arrows, but just notice these uh, green, blue, and red patches. And those represent the associative or cognitive, the limbic or mood networks, and the motor networks, the sensory motor networks. And if you look in these structures, they're very conveniently, for the most part, anatomically separated. So that means that we can place a brain pacemaker or deep brain stimulation lead accurately in the motor regions and not necessarily affect the mood or the cognitive regions. If these were all mixed up together in the brain, I don't think we'd be able to do deep brain stimulation so uh, well for the motor symptoms and the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Sonia, do you have any questions regarding this? Well, I was just gonna say, Dr. Bronte Stewart, that I think all of us sort of in the Parkinson's field know that we're very unique in terms of our presentations and symptoms and progress and prognosis with this disease. And we use medications, and in this case, surgery, in order to benefit us from a quality of life perspective. Is that what you feel is in general, uh, um, the purpose of deep, deep brain stimulation is quality of life issues? I think that's a very, very interesting question. I think when, when we started doing deep brain stimulation, and prior to that, we were doing thalamotomies and pallidotomies, the medical field was very focused on the motor symptoms and how well people did and used that unified Parkinson's disease rating scale and, and really focused on the motor subscale. Uh, and as we can talk about in a little bit, we actually still use that as the main predictor of a good outcome. But recently it's been so interesting that a lot of studies have now carefully looked at quality of life um, studies and non-motor symptoms. And I think the Germans, Gunter Deutschel's group, broke through this early on in their paper, cardinal paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006 and demonstrated that in fact, in advanced Parkinson's disease, subthalamic nucleus 
deep brain stimulation actually was better than best medical therapy for quality of life issues. Uh, and that was actually um, when the field started changing to, to not just focusing on these motor outcomes. So yes, I think study after study now, and we can talk about more specifics, are beginning to show that DBS plus medication is better than medication alone as Parkinson's disease advances for quality of life and certainly non-motor as well as motor symptoms. That's very interesting. Well, I think we're going to probably go on a little bit in the, in the future about um, wh which areas you target and, and why and, and who is best suited for this sort of treatment. Uh, did you want to address that now or would you prefer to move forward? As far as the target? Yes, the target. Yeah, we can address that now or why don't we might maybe just kind of still go to the preoperative thoughts mm -hmm. about who might be the best candidate yes, just to kind of stay in sequence. Um, one thing just to, to talk about, and this is a video, is to show you this little red structure is deep in the brain, and this is the subthalamic nucleus, and it's really tiny, and we have to accurately get to this 125 cubic millimeter structure, and so what we do is we take very fine recording electrodes, and these have a 400 micron tip, and we literally record the electrical activity of the brain. And as you can see here, this is a very nice, what we call a raster of a single neuron firing. And it, you can see that it's not terribly regular and it's kind of bursty. And that's what happens. That's the signature of Parkinson's disease. And what we do is we use this, uh, we are recording. And if you can see, I've got my headphones on here in the operating room. I've actually got these wearable sensors on the patient's uh, limbs and I'm moving their arms and legs around. And you can see in the insert that when I did a rapid extension of the wrist, this unit increased its firing. And what that does is I can hear that in my oscilloscope. For me, it's like listening to an orchestra and a symphony. It's beautiful. And you can map out the sensory motor region extremely accurately. And now what we're moving is we're moving more now towards the whole local network activity and much of the research we're doing and in the work that's moving towards closed loop deep brain stimulation. And an easy analogy to, to think of these signals in the brain is that that single unit firing is as if you're just listening to me right now and everyone's quiet. And the local field potential is if you walked into a cocktail party or in a shopping mall and everybody's having their own conversation as a kind of a little buzz, but you're not hearing anybody talking over anyone else. And that's kind of a good way to think about these two signals. And so what that does is it allows us to be very, very accurate in how we place this deep brain stimulation lead. And that's a very, very important feature. The other thing that's really important, um, let me just get my screen up, sorry. Just as we're waiting, when you say it was 125 cubic millimeters, just to put that in perspective for everyone else, what are we kind of aiming for, is it? Well, if you can see or not see the space between my finger when I bend it over my thumb, yeah. basically it's sort of like that. It's six wow. millimeters by six millimeters by a maximum of eight millimeters. My goodness. And within that little structure, we have to get to that one part, that red shaded part I, sh I showed you in the, um, in the previous slide. So it's, it's, you have to have sub-millimeter accuracy for this, or at least millimeter accuracy. But the brain helps us do that for us. If we, if we do the recording, it actually tells us where to go. It's really a very, very cool procedure. And so looking quickly, just before we get on to kind of the targeting, it's how, how we characterize patients. And as I said at the beginning, and this is still very true, uh, it's so important to do, to have a movement disorder specialist do a very comprehensive evaluation of the person with Parkinson's disease and do this in their best on medication state. And when they have been off their medication for at least 12 hours for short acting medication like Cinemat IR and for at least 24 to 78 hours, depending if you're taking the long acting form of Cinemat or the long acting form of the agonists. And just depending on how well you respond to medication, overall, this predicts how well you'll do with deep brain stimulation. However, over the years, we've learned that there are a couple of what we call carve outs for this situation. Something like tremor doesn't always respond that well to medication, but it does respond very well to deep brain stimulation. So your actual numbers between the on and the off may not be that different, partly because you still have tremor in the on state. 
The other really big carve out is some people may have complications from medications such as dyskinesias or other adverse effects. So they're kind of taking artificially less medication than they maybe could to optimize their motor function and their differential might be a little narrower. So we've, we've moved on from requiring you know, an exact percentage of improvement of the UPDS3 from meds to kind of really thinking of patient by patient. So going down this list, age, I always talk to people about age is biological, not chronological. And we really look at all the other features of how, how people are biologically. However, it is true that as we get older, we may have a little bit more brain atrophy. We may have some more um, what we call microvascular disease in our brain. So we always pair that with our cognitive testing and also our MRI. And that, that is a kind of combination of things is how we use age. And then very, very importantly, we want to make sure that the goals for the patient are aligned with the goals that we think DBS can help the patient with. It's so important to have those aligned goals because the last thing you want is somebody to have the procedure and then come out and say, oh, but I wanted this fixed and it's not fixed. So I think that's also very important. And we can get on to some more of these issues such as when to do the procedure, the quality of life data you've already discussed. Um, and I touched on the fact that the sine qua non for me for this procedure is to have a well-placed lead. And if the lead is not well-placed in these targets, in that sensory motor region or in the region that we found to be useful, sometimes that's a fiber bundle for, for different types of, of uh, movement disorders and neuropsychiatric diseases. But it needs to be very accurately placed because otherwise the brain pacemaker is going to be pacing the wrong structure. So the next question was the target or node identification. And this is a very, very big discussion, so I'm not really gonna go into the whole thing, but for Parkinson's disease, we use either the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus interna. There's a lot of research looking now at other targets such as the globus pallidus externa, uh, tremor. We can also look at the thalamus or the posterior subthalamic area. But for the most part, the subthalamic nucleus and the GPI are the two targets that we use. And different centers have preferences for the targets for different reasons. We can touch on that if there are questions about that, but it's such a big topic. I think at the beginning, maybe we'll just we'll move on and we can address that in, um, you know, as, as the questions come up. And then, as I said, the neurostimulation parameters are, again, it's maybe a little bit too detailed, but there are different parameters sometimes for tremor, versus gait issues that are now being looked at um, more important, you know, more than they used to be. It used to be just kind of a one size fits all and we're moving forward from that. Um, Dr. Bonte Stewart, you mentioned the things that you look for in terms of an ideal candidate for DBS. Are there things that contraindicate or, or don't allow people to go ahead with this um, procedure? Yes, so at the moment, the major contraindication is dementia. And um, I'm going to actually, if it's okay with you, Sonia, I'm going to move forward a couple of slides because I think that might I just address some of your issues. I'm just going to quickly say, this is actually the original data from the Grenard group with David Charles uh, was the first author on this paper. And then the bottom, you can see the preoperative improvement from lethodopa in that UPDRS3. And in the y-axis, you can see the postoperative. And in general, the more improvement you had preoperatively, the more improvement you had postoperatively. That was the first paper that really uh, is the underlying infrastructure for what we use as a predictor. Um, I'm going to just skip over this one. This is the slide I really wanted to get to, and I think this answers or discusses a lot of issues that we, are, we have seen in the questions. Um, the insert on the left here, if my arrow is working, is a very famous study looking at the neuropathology in the brain. Uh, and I'm just gonna summarize it to say that Parkinson's disease, as most people know, is believed to start in really in the brain stem, perhaps, perhaps in the GI tract and in the olfactory bulb, and then the pathology spreads. And when it reaches the basal ganglia, the, the structures we're talking about for DBS, it's actually the, what we call Brock and Brock stage three. And so if you come over here, that's really um, when we diagnose the disease. 
this is a diagram of time on the x-axis and how what symptoms might occur. And as everybody knows, there may be what we call prodromal difficulty with your sense of smell and taste, constipation, mood symptoms, um, and some cognitive symptoms, but we're only diagnosing you here. And what's interesting is that if you go all the way over here to the right, the advanced stages, you can see we, what Sonia and I were just discussing, which is when you get to this stage, there are several reasons why you may not be a good candidate for, part, for deep brain stimulation. The first we've discussed is dementia. And at the moment, we think that is an exclusion criteria. There are very interesting studies coming out looking at people who have mild cognitive impairment, suggesting that uh, they, are, oh, they do do well with DBS. But unfortunately, what happens here is you also may have a lot of risk factors for actually having any type of surgery so that you have more risk for the anesthesia. You may have more risk for being to, able to try and stay awake with us. You may have more brain atrophy. That may make the targeting even more difficult, but not because now that little subthalamic nucleus is not as easy to see. The other structures have atrophied or changed around it. And I think that may be something we don't discuss enough because it makes the targeting a little bit more error prone. And as Dr. Jamie Henderson of the neurosurgeon I work with says, you can have little errors and you can have several of them and they'll add up to bigger errors. So that you can see that with risk factors. You have you know, a risk factor here, a risk factor there. You may be more likely to have more hypertension and microvascular disease. All of this sets you up for having more risks and the risk to benefit ratio is not as good as it is if you're now at these earlier stages of disease when you've got a lot to gain and we can talk about how you can use a medication with DBS. And I'm just gonna to touch on this slide as well. The circles here are the aspects that will, it can improve and have evidence-based um, literature to support improvement from deep brain stimulation. The ones we all know about that we started off discussing are the cardinal motor signs of Parkinson's disease. And now with 20, 21 years of doing this, um, I have patients who still come, come and they ha still have no tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. What I think we're beginning to understand now, which is even more fascinating, is how many of the non-motor signs actually can improve with deep brain stimulation. And these include GI motility, some of the urinary dysfunction, uh, we, orthostatic hypotension is something that is made worse with medication, we can reduce medication, we can actually make this better to the point that some people can actually get up and walk around. Issue of fatigue, anything in yellow has got mixed evidence. Um, depression and anxiety, very interesting. Some studies suggest that people get much better with depression, with DBS, some people suggest that they don't. This is another cardinal um, exclusion criterion which is if you have untreated psychiatric disease, such as depression or anxiety, we tend to try to wait until that's, under, that's well treated because we do know that after deep brain stimulation, if it's not well treated, it can sometimes get worse. Um, so we can, we can carry on there talking about cognition here if you want, but I just wanna hand it back to you, Sonia, if there are any other questions at this stage. No, that's a great slide. I'd like to stick with, with it for a moment. But I just uh, one, one of the questions we had was something that you mentioned previously, and that's the response to Cinemet in terms of um, using that as a uh, guideline for DBS or a predictor of how well DBS will work. And they asked, um, do they have the same mechanism of action in the brain, DBS and Cinemet? If so, then will DBS start not working over time as well? Yes, that is a really good question. And I don't think that um, I can answer that completely specifically because there are, again, there's literature showing that deep brain stimulation actually can increase the amount of dopamine release uh, in the basal ganglia and there are other studies that show it doesn't. I think overall, one would say that the final common pathway seems to be the same because the patients improve in their mobility. Where we differ, um, where it differs is now, as I say, it's, kind, it's becoming interesting because there are clearly differences in the non-motor symptoms of the effect of deep brain stimulation and medication. <clears throat> and there's a very, very interesting recent um, meta-analysis of the European early STEM trial, 
And this trial took on patients who are less than 61 years old, and they had to have a greater than 50% response to levodopa preparations prior to the surgery, which, which is a little higher than many of the, the studies require. But of those patients, they showed that they, they looked at the behavioral effects of after two years of DBS plus best medical therapy or best medical therapy alone. And they separated these out into hypodopaminergic symptoms such as apathy, depression, anxiety, irritability, non-motor fluctuations, which I know many people experience, which is sort of a euphoria on medication, a dysphoria, feeling really bad was medication wears off. And then they looked at hyperdopaminergic symptoms such as, you know, um, if the patient is what sometimes our patients call amped up, if they're somewhat hypomanic or impulsive, those kind of hyperdopaminergic symptoms. And they showed that in actual fact, both therapies were about the same for the hypodopaminergic symptoms after two years. The, on, the fluctuation smoothed out with DBS plus best medical therapy. And in actual fact, DBS plus best medical therapy was much better for the hyperdopaminergic symptoms as time went on. Having said that, I think the question that I saw that most people are really sort of interested in is what happens right at the beginning with medication and deep brain stimulation? Because that is a very interesting and a very difficult time for many people. And it's something worth spending some time on. Um, one of the questions we saw is what happens when the neurosurgeon leaves the room? And what happens when somebody starts the programming? And if you think about it, the brain has been used to seeing medication and all that medication does, what it does to the non-motor symptoms, what it does to the motor symptoms. And all of a sudden we're introducing this new therapy, which is basically, as I said, brain pacing, chronic electrical stimulation of these targets. And what we have to do is if we, with subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation, we are able to reduce the medication, but it's extremely important not to do that too quickly because then you can actually elicit these hypodopaminergic symptoms. And which gets a little bit at your question is that those we think are being um, promoted by the mesolimbic dopaminergic system, not the motor dopaminergic symptom. And if you take away the medication too quickly, the DBS is clearly not affecting that pathway as much as the medication because you can fall into a hypodopaminergic state uh, and, unless you go slowly. But we do know that over time, that pathway probably picks up its own dopaminergic production once it doesn't see so much medication. It kind of kicks in on its own again. So if you do this very gradually, you can avoid falling into that hypodopaminergic state. Similarly, if you think about the hyperdopaminergic state, if you've got subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation and you just keep going at your same amount of medication, you're probably going to be over-treated and therefore you can have hyperdopaminergic symptoms such as hypomania, dyskinesias, um, maybe some psychosis. And you, so that has to be very carefully monitored. So I think there are differences in the, in the networks that these two therapies affect, but they also can affect the same symptoms such as the motor network. And you have to be very careful how you balance these right after surgery. And it's a very individual type of, of uh, therapy. From what you're saying, um, from a practical point of view, Dr. Bronte Stewart, how does that work for a patient? They go in for their surgery, they're you know, done fairly quickly and successfully, I'm sure. And then what happens in terms of the post-operative uh, time for them? Great, yes. So we have a fairly standard protocol, and that is that the patient uh, has the leads placed in one procedure, which we do with them awake. They usually stay in the hospital overnight, and then a week later, they have their neurostimula neurostimulator implanted, which is actually done under anesthesia, but they still go home the same day. About 10 days later, they're going to see our neurosurgery colleagues and have their sutures removed and have a, a check on everything. And then a month later, they'll come back to the movement disorders clinic and we'll have a very long uh, initial programming session. And at that time, we, we have a standard protocol. We go through every, lead, every electrode on the leads and we determine using just that electrode how much benefit they get and what their therapeutic window is, i.e. 
How much intensity do we need to build them up to before they get side effects? And from that, we get a therapeutic window for each electrode. We choose the electrode or the electrode combinations that are the best for them. But then we very carefully set the voltage or the current much lower than what we've seen as maybe their optimal current because they're still on their pre-operative medication level. With each patient, it's quite different. But I can tell you that my usual goal is if somebody's had quite a lot of dyskinesias before surgery, I will go even lower and slower in my switchover from medication to DBS because deep brain stimulation in the early stages can actually enhance dyskinesias. Even if I do that, um, some of our patients go home and they may not experience the dyskinesias in the clinic, but they call us the next day and they say, whoa, I'm way dyskinetic. And so what we have to do is readjust. So it's amazing how individual this is. If I have somebody who has tremor, I will advise them that it might take three to six months to really get that tremor under control permanently. It may come, we'll control it in the operating room. It's, it can just be controlled immediately, but it may come back. So each symptom has, it, <clears throat> excuse me, has its own kind of time course for immediate treatment, long-term treatment, and then, as I said, avoiding the side effects of switching over from medication to DBS by going too quickly. But my goal is to use deep brain stimulation to do most of the work. Otherwise, why would you go through that procedure? And then use medication if the patient feels that there's some things medication is helping them with that DBS didn't. So that's our standard protocol. And I advise people that at least for the first three months, we're going to be adjusting things. And then between three and six months, we're hopefully optimizing your balance of DBS and medication. And then we're going to keep tuning it as time goes on. So it's in the operating room that you determine the, the ideal settings because the patient's off and awake. But um, what do you do when uh, you do DBS under uh, sedation or when they're asleep? I've heard right. that. So, so we actually don't, we don't optimize anything in the operating room. We use that initial programming time four weeks later because one of the reasons to wait four weeks, and again, we learned this early on, is that no matter how quick the procedure is, you may have slight shifts of cerebrospinal fluid. You may have a little bit of air here or there. And if you have an electrical current going into the brain, the CSF is saline. So it's going to shoot that current in directions that aren't really the um, steady state. So once you've waited for about a month, everything's sort of back to where it was before. And so when you do the programming, you'll get a fairly repro reproducible and representative type of programming. What we do in the operating room is we're really identifying that sensory motor region. And then we're testing it to make sure that we, have, we aren't too close to neighboring structures such as the motor fibers in the internal capsule or the sensory fibers so that we don't have too many side effects and just making sure that we're in, the, in that sensory motor region. But we don't do any kind of programming in the OR. So to answer your question, I think, which was what happens if you have to do this when you're asleep? What you do is you lose that whole part of the electrophysiology of, of really determining that sensory motor region. So you're relying on your anatomical guidance. And neurosurgeons are very good at doing that. But we've shown that at least in the pallidum, the sensory motor region might not actually be in exactly the same place for everybody. So we always tell our patients, and some people can't tolerate this awake, that we have very good targeting, very, very good neurosurgeons, but that we will be missing one piece of information. And we have to all just agree that that's how we're going to do the procedure. Great. Um, and one of our viewers is asking, why does it seem like some people have an easy time for others? It takes forever to get it right when they're talking about the programming of their DBS. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that, again, it, it's, it's verging on sort of, I'm not sure I can answer that question. <clears throat> because I think this is such individual therapy. So it's quite difficult, but I can tell you that, again, there are preoperative reasons, there are intraoperative reasons, and there are postoperative reasons. So what, what the neurosurgical team and the neuro, neurological team are aiming for is to make sure you're, you have the best preoperative criteria to predict success, that we get the lead and exactly where we want it to get to in, in the operating room, 
and that post-operatively we've done very careful programming of each electrode on each lead to understand the therapeutic window on each electrode. So if you're not having a good response, it could be for any one of those reasons of pre, intra, or post, and, and that would be an individual discussion. Sure. And um, how, but how long does it take? You were mentioning you follow up at, at one month and then very soon after that. Um, and you probably see patients every three months or so, is that correct? Or how That's long right. does it normally take? How, how often does a patient have to get things reprogrammed? So again, it's very individual. We have a standard protocol that after the programming, we see them one month later. And then if, if everything's on track, we see them three months after that. But in between times, we're communicating, usually by my health and on the phone, if there's anything that has to be changed, such as the way we're reducing the medication. And then we see them every three months for the first year. And if everything's very optimized, many patients then only need to be seen every six months. Okay. Um, I usually like to work with a primary neurologist. Some patients come from far away and I see a lot of people for DBS. So I work with a primary neurologist who can work with their medications and other aspects so that the patient can get, you know, care locally uh, immediately if they need it, but they can keep coming to see us on a six month basis. And then I have patients, as I say, who are 14, 15, 16 years out, and they just basically call me up every year to come and make sure that everything's going well. And I really am not changing anything at that point. It's very interesting. So how long does it usually last? Again, is that an individual? How long does what last? The DBS, the effect of DBS. Yeah, so I think there's another very interesting issue that um, we were giving a talk uh, at the University of Minnesota a year and a half ago, and, and uh, a physician stood up and said, yeah, this is all very good, but we all know DBS only works for a year. <laughs> and uh, I think that the, the overall answer to that is, from my experience now with a good, we're coming up for 20 years at, at Stanford, the cardinal motor signs on this slide of bradykinesia, tremor, and rigidity of your limbs are better, um, and they stay better. Um, as some people have experienced when they've had to have the system turned off after a long period of time, surprisingly, things like sleep and urinary function, some of the non-motor symptoms, were actually being treated better than they thought. And I think all of us were surprised until some of this literature is coming out. However, there are axial symptoms, as we call them, such as balance and freezing of gait, that we have published several studies showing that these do improve with DBS, STN DBS and GPI DBS. However, it seems that something goes on over time with the progression of the disease and DBS. And if you turn the DBS off, which we're doing in our research, they're much worse. So they're actually getting some improvement, but is not fixing it anymore. And I think this is the challenge that we're all working on right now. And, and we, we probably don't have time to go into it in this webinar, but this is where I hope closed loop is going to actually help us with some of these symptoms. And I am very interested now in the aspect of tolerance. And that is we're bombarding this brain with high frequency stimulation 24 seven at the same parameters. And our brain is a very, very smart structure. And it probably starts getting a little you know, it stops listening to those signals after a while. So there are some other aspects that are progression of disease, perhaps this aspect of tolerance that make people think, well, it's not working anymore. But if they actually look at the symptoms that they had when they, before they had DBS, they'll see that it is actually working. It's just there are other symptoms of PD that are either not as well treated now or weren't there before and are showing up. So it's a, again, it's a very individual discussion, but I think this slide is quite interesting because it shows us that you could draw another slide here um, and you could do it for somebody on DBS. And I think it would look very different from this slide. Yeah, that would be interesting. And just back to the slide, um, you know, we often think in the community that DBS is something that comes later on when you're in later stages of diseases, yet, Studies have come out, I believe, that show that early intervention may have better outcomes. Do you want yes. to discuss the timing? Yes. Of the this is my, for anybody who knows me, this is, this is probably one of my um, biggest concerns 
is it's very, very sad for me when somebody comes for a DBS eval and they're too far to the right of this slide. If you look at the green circles here, it wouldn't be too far fetched to say, why aren't we doing this right when we get diagnosed? Because we know that we can improve some of these non motor aspects that are there before we even were diagnosed. And I have some very good colleagues at Stanford who keep me grounded, um, who tell me, yes, well, that's all fine and dandy, but the reason we don't do this right at the beginning of the onset of symptoms is that there are other Parkinsonian disorders, such as multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy. Some of these disorders early on can look very similar to, deep, to Parkinson's disease, and we want to make sure that the person has a good response to dopaminergic medication. Now, the latest diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease actually require for clinically established PD that you have a response to dopaminergic medication. And that is probably one of the biggest reasons why we don't just jump in and do this right away. Um, but I have certain patients who've come and really would like this procedure within two, three years of their diagnosis. That means the disease might've been going on for four or five years. And we do our very standard DBS evaluation. And I certainly have several of those patients who've done extremely well, very stable. So I think we're too far to the right at the moment of this time course of PD for many, many patients. And we really need to move this time of, of referring people for DBS back towards the left, but maybe we're not quite ready we don't have enough resolution of diagnostic markers yet to really pinpoint, okay, you've got Parkinson's disease, you should have this procedure now because it's going to avoid all of those complications of medication, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're in this phase right now where um, we're, we're trying to move this to the left from where a lot of people refer patients to us. So I think number one take home message is, this is absolutely not last ditch therapy because unfortunately at that point you'll be in that red zone and you probably won't be a good candidate for many of the reasons we discussed. Um, and when you are experiencing, beginning to experience the fluctuations, the wearing off, maybe some dyskinesias, that is a good time to consider DBS. And personally, I would love to see it move a little earlier if it's safe for everyone so that we don't experience the fluctuations. We can actually avoid that whole change in the brain that goes on uh, with fluctuations. The early STEM trial in Europe, um, I think has taken us a good step forward with this and I'd recommend that everyone look at that. Um, and they were very careful in that they had patients on medication, they had documented they had a good response to medication. In fact, they had to have a greater than 50% response to medication. So they are quite selective in these patients, but they did extremely well. And I think that more studies looking at earlier stages of disease will help us move where we are a little bit more to the left for, and hopefully most people will will understand that and you know this is similar to many other surgeries like coronary artery bypass grafting a lot of surgeries that we now take for granted we know when to do this early on it's always sort of a well this is an invasive procedure so should, we should wait for this to be a last stitch procedure this is actually one of the safest procedures you can have as far as readmission rate in the first 30 days. For deep brain stimulation, it's 2.9%. For your standard back operation, it's about 14%. So, uh, you know, with everything taken in context, this is actually a very safe procedure. That's, that's amazing. I didn't know those complication results. It's, it's really great. Um, there's a couple of questions about symptoms themselves and probably that could be answered from some of this um, information on the slide. One person wants to know though, does DBS help with the restless leg syndrome feeling that people get? Good question. And not always, no. Um, a lot of people still need medication for restless leg syndrome um, after deep brain stimulation. It's certainly not. If you came to us with that being your single and only reason to have DBS, we probably would be discussing that that might not be the, the best treatment. And what about if you are a young onset Parkinson's patient with a freezing of gait? Does wow. that preclude you from having the surgery? Absolutely not. This is again an area, I think there are very mixed results, but we have done a lot of research in this area. 
uh, there are two types of freezing of gait preoperatively, and that is freezing of gait that responds to dopaminergic medication and freezing of gait that does not respond to dopaminergic medication. Uh, and again, you have to make sure you've given the patient a really good trial of dopaminergic medication. Um, in early stage PD, if you have, or in, in young onset PD, if you have freezing of gait, um, one is assuming it's not the freezing of gait that's really linked to cognitive deficits and dementia. If it gets better with medication, we have shown that it definitely gets better with deep brain stimulation. If it does not get better with medication, there is not good evidence that it is actually going to get better with deep brain stimulation. So this is different from tremor. Tremor may not do well with medication, but we know it does do well with DBS. Freezing of gait that does not respond to medication, your, your team is going to be more circumspect about whether they can really assure you that DBS will improve that on freezing of gait. Um, the Michael Okens group in the University of Florida took on this very, very difficult symptom, which luckily is quite rare. Uh, and they showed with closed loop that you could get some improvement, but these are very, very difficult symptoms. So, so making that distinction is very important. And what about loss of balance, Dr. Branches Stewart? So loss of balance, I think is, again, it's one of my, uh, I'm very, very interested in this. And balance is one word that describes a ton of symptoms. So you can have difficulty with balance because your center of gravity is tipped backwards. So as many people who have more advanced Parkinson's disease know that without realizing it, they're leaning backwards. And as we don't have much of our feet behind us, that makes you more likely to fall. In, in, in conjunction with that, you may have slowed reaction times and your truncal movement might be slow. So if you do kind of lean back off your, what we call your base of support, your feet, you don't have the writing reflexes to get back over your base of support in time. That posterior displacement, that retropulsion, is not something that necessarily improves with DBS. Mm -hmm. There are other aspects of balance that do improve with DBS, and one of them is how you use your environmental senses to maintain balance. So we all use our vision, we use the sensory feedback from our feet or if we're sitting down from our rear end or if we're lying down from our body uh, or if we're doing handstands from our hands um, and we use our vestibular system. If you perturb those, you can show that in fact in Parkinson's disease, the deficit is in something we call sensory motor integration. The brain has a very difficult time remembering how to integrate that sensory information without kind of having to do it from first principles again. And so people will say their balance is more difficult in the dark on a soft carpet trying to get to the bathroom at night, for instance, or walking on a rocky path. And that's usually when their proprioceptive feedback is limited. And if it's in the dark, their vision's limited. What we've shown is that the patients who have those problems preoperatively, they can actually often get worse on medication, but they get better on deep brain stimulation. Great. If you're standing still, you have a sort of certain postural sway that's good you want to be able to sway more but you don't want to sway too much and medication actually increases that postural sway area uh, which is beyond that which is is normal and med and dbs contracts it motor aspects of balance include your writing reflexes so dbs and medication both improve your speed of writing just like it will your speed of anything but actually they don't improve that reaction time so when we pass out all the different aspects of balance, we can show you, and this is why doing posturography or balance testing is a part of our preoperative evaluation and it is part of our initial programming evaluation because then we can actually pass out and tell our patient what aspects of their balance we think we can help them with and what aspects we don't think we can help them with, basically with the change of medication to DBS, uh, medication alone, DBS alone. So right. long answer, but balance is one word that describes a lot of things. A lot of things, right. Um, there's a general question about improvement between men and women, different ethnic groups, age of onset, genomics, and that sort of thing. Are there differences in these groups? And uh, if so, what are they? So I'm not really aware of any differences in gender, um, except to say that, that, as everybody knows, Parkinson's is more common in men. 
Um, age of onset is interesting, and I think, again, it relates somewhat to this slide. Young onset Parkinson's disease can be often what we are used to call a sort of pure dopaminergic syndrome. They do extremely well with dopaminergic medication, but they get fluctuations and dyskinesias fairly early. And people with young onset PD are, do extremely well with deep brain stimulation. And again, done at the appropriate time. People who are a little older when they get Parkinson's disease may of course have some other types of vascular disease or other reasons why they may not be the best candidate for deep brain stimulation. And they may not or sometimes don't respond to medication as well. So as I said at the beginning, we don't use age just by itself, but age often dictates other things that we also take into account. As far as ethnicity, I don't think there's any demonstration that one ethnic group responds better than others. It's more wrapped into the, their type of disease. Okay. In the last few minutes, there's um, a lot of questions about sort of the practicalities of it, the um, sort of the, the pros and cons of fixed versus rechargeable batteries, which right. type of um, DBS um, company would you go with, and the differences between the I guess the what we have now in closed loop DBS. If you right. want to some of that, yeah, we'll do that. We'll just swing forward to um, this other slide because this is just really saying what we were saying before. That was just me talking about moving it, and then we'll just stop. This is don't get worried about this, but this tells you how things have changed. Um, these are the different leads that are now available. Um, the top two are the Boston Scientific leads. The top one is their, basically a their spinal cord lead that has eight electrodes. And their second lead is what we call the directional lead. The next two are the standard Medtronic leads, the one that has the small spacing, which is exactly the same spacing as the Boston 2201 lead. And then the 3387, which was originally designed for the thalamus um, for tremor, which was its original designation and some people still use that for Globus pallidus. We'll, we'll skip the next one. And then there are the other St. Jude Abbott uh, leads. Again, they also have a directional lead. And um, this is becoming complicated, but interesting. And I'm just gonna quickly show you why. You might think with your um, neurologist and neurosurgeon that you might want to use one of these different leads. So in this picture, you see um, an example of a Boston Scientific uh, spinal cord eight electrode or eight contact lead in the thalamus. And this is for somebody to treat somebody with tremor. And we all know that, that sometimes we might want to use the big circle there and target the thalamus itself. And then there are many studies that have shown that actually tremor may be well treated in this posterior thalamic area. And with this lead, you can actually then target both and you can put a small amount of current in one and a large amount of current in another. So this is something that we're uh, looking at in our institution and I think might be a very good use of the long lead from Boston Scientific. Um, the other one is this directionality. And as we discussed at the beginning, the most important thing is to get that lead in the right place. Sometimes maybe you're not completely in the center of that sensory motor region, so that when you have a, a, what we call a concentric ring electrode, the field may encroach on this area that's called the CPIP, and that's the internal capsule or the motor fibers, or it might encroach on another structure you don't want. Now we have the capability to actually steer the field more in one direction from the other. And so ideally, if your lead is slightly too lateral, slightly too anterior or posterior, the, the neurologist can then actually steer the field uh, to make, to give you the best effect without the side effects. If you have a well-placed lead, the concentric ring electrode has been and will, will be fine. Um, what I don't have on here is the differences in the pulse generators. Um, and I think the big things really to remember are at the moment, um, you can have an MRI scan if you have the Medtronic systems. You cannot have an MRI scan if you have Boston Scientific systems, although they are working towards that. And it's just, it's been approved recently for the Abbott systems. Um, the, the other thing to remember is that the Boston Scientific systems are all rechargeable. 
Medtronic has a rechargeable and a non-rechargeable option. The rechargeable is nice in that your battery should last for longer. It's clocked in as lasting for 14, 15 years with Medtronic. It lasts five to 14 years with Boston. But you have to remember that that means you have to recharge it all the time. So some patients come back and say, I didn't realize I was going to have to sit and recharge myself every night or every week. And it makes me remember that I have Parkinson's and I don't like that. Other people will say, I don't mind recharging. I just do it like I clean my teeth and it's fine. And I much prefer that I know I won't have to go in for a battery replacement. So those are the main, just, just I mean, there's some other differences, but those are the main differences that, that you need to know about. And we have a sheet that we give to our patients that uh, just outlines some of the differences. And we have to update it because things are changing pretty quickly. Um, and I, it won't be too long before all the companies have all the options. Uh, but right now, different companies have moved forward with different aspects. You know, um, Medtronic are really moving forward on the closed loop phenomenon. Boston Scientific and Abbott have the directional leads. I know Medtronic's working on directional leads. I'm sure the others are working on closed loop and sensing. So we're, we're in that phase right now where we have, so we do have to think about the different options uh, not so much different companies, but the different options for the leads and the simulators themselves. As far as closed loop, this is still investigative. Um, it's very exciting. We are very involved in it. Uh, we are looking towards um, an international study where we will be doing closed loop uh, stimulation to achieve uh, FDA approval and CEU mark approval in Europe uh, so that that can be used by everybody. Um, and what's hopefully coming out before that is the actual sensing capacity so that you are, if you use the Medtronic system, your neurologist will actually be able to read off those local field potentials, um, the rhythms in your brain and look at them and maybe use those to choose which active electrode um, to use. We're now moving into closed loop deep brain stimulation for freezing of gait. Um, and I have a lot of hope that it might help us with some of the side effects such as this wearing off or this tolerance with DBS, but that's very preliminary. Um, and we, we need to do a lot more research um, before it's ready for prime time, but it's, it's a very exciting advance. This, this is sort of ties into this as advances occur. Can you redo the DBS that you've had done or is it a one shot procedure? That's a, a really good question. Mostly you, mostly the leads, you don't want to redo the leads unless they're not working correctly, unless they're maybe in the, not in the right place or there's some side effect. But the, the way that the companies are going to move forward with these systems is that, yes, you will be able to swap out one battery for another. And actually, some groups are already swapping. They're all already mixing systems. Um, now, that is, there is no evidence that, that is published that that's safe. Um, but it probably is safe, but I ha that has to be taken up with your own neurologist and neurosurgeon. But as far as switching within systems from a um, rechargeable to non-rechargeable, from an open loop to a closed loop, um, that is probably all going to be uh, fairly standard. And I'm sure that as the studies come out, the companies will determine whether mixing their systems are safe or not and will do the appropriate studies and therefore get um, that on their, on their um, inserts. But right now that's not there. All right. So as our time comes to an end, I have one last question to ask you, Dr. Rondi Stewart. For someone who has already decided they're going to undergo DBS, what is the one piece of advice you'd get the, give them to mentally prepare for the procedure? A couple of pieces of advice. Make sure you are evaluated by a fellowship trained movement disorder specialist who has a lot of experience in DBS. And as I said, we've seen this with coronary artery bypass graft procedures where all of a sudden everybody was doing them and then it moved back towards more of these big centers. Make sure when you see the neurosurgeon that you ask about their outcomes, preferably published, that you know how that center and how that neurosurgeon does. Get, make sure you feel really confident in your team. And then to mentally prepare, we used to talk to people about try preparing for an athletic event. Make sure that you keep exercising. You want your body in really as good a form as it can possibly be 
to do this procedure. It's not because it's such an arduous procedure, but any kind of surgical procedure with anesthesia, we ask you to be awake so that you can help us with finding exactly the right spot. Um, you either have to have your whole head shaved or part of it shaved. This is something that is going to be somewhat stressful for your body. Make sure that you are prepared. And most importantly, make sure that it's you who want it, not your spouse, not your family, not your doctor, but that you want it. You can see past it and you can see what you're going to gain. And, and we know that if that's the case, most people sail through surgery. So we could wrap all of that up with saying, being an, be an informed, educated, and very um, a patient who's in control. Don't, don't, don't let somebody else push you into this. That's great advice. Thank you, Dr. Bronte Stewart, for your wisdom and your expertise in sharing that with us today. And thank you to everyone else for joining us today. I hope you found it as educational and helpful as I did. And remember, we may not have a choice in our diagnosis, but how we face the challenges that this disease brings, it's really ours to determine. So as Dr. Bronte Stewart was saying, choose to optimize your quality of life, educate yourself, empower yourself, and celebrate your daily victories. Thanks again.